Hello everyone, this is Shampreeti and welcome back to my channel yet again. I created a poll a couple of days back where I gave four options and uh, the second and third options which are make a strategy for GATE 2023 and start a literary theory series. These two got the most votes. The first was first question and answer video with me and the fourth one was um, just stop making videos and one person voted to that stop making videos well i know who is he or she is um uh, i just want to say sorry uh i'm not gonna stop making videos anytime soon <laughs> unfortunately or fortunately well okay so uh, starting a literary theory series got the most votes so I'm going to start literary theory series and this is going to be um, tallied with the notes that I made. So first one should be formalism because new criticism came after formalism, so to say, as a reaction to it. But in my notebook, I have made notes on new criticism first. So I'm going with new criticism first. Lecture one will be on new criticism. Lecture two will be on formalism. Lecture three will be on structuralism and it will go on like that. Also, also another thing I want to share is that um, with every video, I'm going to attach a PDF of a very precise, crisp note on the same. Like for new criticism in this video, in the description box, you will find a gist of the lecture uh, as a PDF. So you can go visit the link and download it. Okay. It's for free, all right? So let's start today's video. This is the start of the literary theory series that I'm going to make. And I will discuss all the major literary theories and uh, uh, literary theorists and all the trends and the, and the movements and the literary theory schools and theorists and their books and their concepts in, in these videos. So before we move on to this video, so you can like this video, share with your friends and don't forget to comment. Please, please comment because without your comments, I will not know how I'm doing and what areas should I need to sharpen uh, and what are the things that I need to work on because I'm also a learner like you all so please please do comment and do subscribe to my channel to be updated and uh, to watch every informative video like this whenever it is uh, uploaded so subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet well without further ado let's start today's video uh, P.S. There is a puja going on outside my house so there might be noises uh, bear with it I'm so sorry for that I'm sharing my screen. All right. So today's the first lecture one of this literary theory series is new criticism. It is a reaction to Russian formalism, so to say, which came uh, in Russia. The formalism in Russia came in like 1920s and new criticism emerged in 1940s and 50s in America. All right. So let's start with this. And from the name itself, you know that it is a criticism that is very new. It's a criticism that is very new. Before delving deep into this literary criticism, I want to share one thing with you all. What is theory and what is criticism? New criticism is a theory as well as a criticism. Why? Criticism is evaluating a literary work or a person or some something, anything, okay? You will say, like don't criticize too much or please do a criticism of this, okay? Self-criticism uh, self is very vital to grow as a person. Criticism doesn't necessarily mean something negative. It also means positive, like constructive criticism. So all in all, criticism is evaluating 
someone evaluating a work of art, a work of literary art or anything. Literary theory, on the other hand, is like a tool with the use of which you can appreciate or criticize, so to say, a literary work or any work of art. So literary theory is a tool wherein literary criticism is a process. I hope it is a little bit clear to you all because literary theory and criticism, this is a very vulnerable uh, area for all the net set gate aspirants in English literature. They are very scared of it. And I assure you that after I take these classes, your um, fear will go a little bit, go away a little bit, okay? So let's start. Let's say, read these lines, okay? Then she looked at me and the scent of the earth and smoke rained on my soul and heart. I looked at her eyes deep as some unknown cavern. I watched her walking into the moonlit kennel towards the universe upside down. Uh, I'm not saying who wrote this. Who wrote this? You have no idea, all right? So take a look at these lines and tell me what does this passage mean? Okay, just try, all right? Then she looked at me. We know that the author or the poet, whoever is writing this, is talking about a woman who looked at the author, the narrator, and the scent of the earth and smoke rained on my soul and heart. The language is very poetic. It's almost a Kitsian sense as well as a very Victorian sensibility to it. I looked at her eyes, deep as some unknown cavern, a smell of gold ridge. I watched her walking into the moonlit canal. Okay. Towards the universe upside down. It has an abstract tilt to it, right? Okay. So without knowing the author, without knowing the poet, you have a certain idea about it. Let's say I tell you this is written by William Wordsworth. What will be your reaction? You will definitely have a conceived idea that um, this is a romantic piece, maybe part of an essay. Uh, definitely, it does not talk about any surreal theme because William Wordsworth mostly talked about the romantic and the sublime. Then I just cross that, that no, it's not written by William Wordsworth. It's written by Kurt Vonnegut, a postmodern writer. Oh my God, your, your perception towards this definitely changes. Like the perception, perception itself gets uh, tilted to upside down, right? So you don't know who wrote this. And we are so reliable on the author and the poet and the context that we tend to figure out a work of art based on who wrote that. Let me tell you guys, this is just a line from a story written by me, okay? And you get the point of new criticism now. They say that, they say that no need to talk about the author or the reader or sorry, the author or the context or the, or the um, situation in where it was written. The core uh, importance should be given to the reader, the present and the interpretation of the reader and the text. The text is the central thing. Okay. So I'm not, so when I'm not saying the name of the poet or the author, you need to focus on the text and the words, and each word, what is lying in between the lines. And that is new criticism without thinking about the author, without thinking about the situation without thinking about the era in which it was written without thinking about the context in which it was written you are 
putting all the importance on the text itself. This is called new criticism. Or the practical criticism, as says I.A. Richards, one of the most important new critics. In his book, Practical Criticism, I.A. Richards does the same thing with his students. He gives them a poem, a piece of poem, and he says that, judge this poem. And he gets a very positive reactions. He gets a very positive reactions to it. That is the close reading of a text. Okay, the close reading of the text is a very important term in new criticism. However, I think you have a little bit of idea about new criticism right now. It completely breaks away from the Russian formalism that talked about forms and structures of a work and the author's intentions and stuff like that. Whereas new criticism talks about whatever lies inside the text, the language, the paradox, whatever is going on, whatever mystery is going on in the text itself. Text for the new critics is an entire being in itself. Okay, so let's talk about new criticism. As I said, it focuses on the text itself rather than the author's intentions or the historical or social context in which it was written. It emphasizes, close, it emphasizes close reading of the text to understand its meaning and structure. And this approach was prominent in the 1940s and 50s in America and is considered one of the most important methodologies in literary criticism, as I have just pointed out. Now let's talk about some new critics. Before going on to those slides, let me tell you, I have only gathered a few important literary critic, lit new critics in this video because it's not possible to talk about all the critics in the one video. But in, my, in the note that I have attached to it, in the description box, you will find a list of important figures in new criticism. Also, if you have purchased my notes, those who, who have purchased my notes, tally my notes and this lecture together so that you will have a clear, crystal clear idea about new criticism altogether. Okay. So, the term new criticism was first used by J.E. Spinger, Joel Elias Spinger. Look at the spelling. And this is a very frequent question in UGC net and said. And JC Ransom used the term as his book title in his book, The New Criticism. The New Criticism. New Criticism has two important quotes. One is autotelic text, another is close reading. These are two moot points of New Criticism. What is the autotelic text? What is the autotelic text? Autotelic text means any text that contains a meaning in itself. The text itself is a being, which is, which is unified in its form. And it is free from any influence of the author, of the literary era, of the, of the situation, of the context, or anything else. It is an independent being in itself. That is autotelic text. And another is close reading. Close reading means reading the text and reading in between the lines without thinking about what had uh, would have had impacted the text, so to say. One of the most prominent figures in New Criticism was I.A. Richards. In his seminal work, Meaning of Meaning, a study of the influence of language upon thought and the science of symbolism. This is a, uh, a pillar of new criticism or practical criticism, so to say. Okay, I. Richards was more of a uh, figure in practical criticism rather than new criticism. Okay, and this meaning of meaning, the subtitle is very important. Subtitle is a study of the influence of language upon thought and the science of symbolism it was written in 1923. And it was written um, jointly by C.K. Ogden and I.A. Richards. C.K. Ogden was also a very important new critic. 
and later C.K. Ogden and I.A. Richards uh, founded one uh, school that is called BASIC, B-A-S-I-C, which is also the acronym for British American Scientific International and Commercial English. This has come in your Senate exam multiple times, okay? Basic, basic English, a general introduction with rules and grammar, a 1930 book written jointly by I. Richards and C.K. Ogden. And the full form of basic is British American Scientific International and Commercial English. Again, I'm saying, guys, it's not possible to include all this information in one video. So just refer to my lecture and note it down. And if you have my notes, then you have nothing to worry because all these things are written there. You will get them there. Now, in the book, Meaning of Meaning, this structure is um, discussed by I. Richards. That is called that is called the triangle of reference, the triangle of reference, a triangular relation among thought, symbol, and referent. Okay, just know about this. Just know that triangle of reference was talked about in meaning of meaning, and it is a triangular relationship among thought or reference, symbol, and referent. Okay, you don't have to know much detail about it. Another very important book is Practical Criticism. The subtitle of it is more important than the book itself, okay? Because it, again, has been mul multiple times asked in NetSet. Uh, it is a study of literary judgment. If I'm not wrong, I may be wrong, it was also asked in GATE 2020. I'm not sure. Either in GATE 2020 or Gujarat SET, okay? So study of literary judgment. This is... Um, the subtitle of Practical Criticism. The Philosophy of Rhetoric is another important book. Principles of Literary Criticism. This is another important book. See, uh, in 2021, 2022, 2020, UGC NET, the books are asked. The, name of, the names of the books are asked. So it's very important to know the names of the books of the major uh, theorists and critics. Okay? Um, know about what was written in the books also but more important than that you must know the names of the major works of these writers. I. Richards talks about two important concepts one is two uses of language that is scientific and emotive scientific and emotive and he also talks about four kinds of meanings okay these are sensual meanings meanings based on feeling meaning based on tone and meaning based on intention okay so in his work practical criticism this book practical criticism he talks about four kinds of meanings okay sense is whatever i'm, I'm trying to convey feeling is uh, when you are trying to get the meaning from a work based on your own emotion or feeling tone is the tone of the narration you are uh, assuming the meaning of the text by assuming the tone and intention is conscious or unconscious intention of the author or the narrator that is that has been trapped in the text itself it is all about close reading of the text is nothing to do with the author or stuff like that or the histor historical context or something like that every concept every term is related to the text itself another major figure william emson he talks about seven types of ambiguity in his book of the same name. He also talks about uh, Paradise Lost in his book, Milton's God. Milton's God. He defends Milton's ways of justifying gods. Uh, sorry, justifying Satan. And Faustus and Censor. This is another book on censorship by William Empson. William Empson's seven types of ambiguity is a kind of complex thing to uh, convey. I have discussed it in my notes very um, elaborately, but it is not possible to give it here comprehensively. So I have attached a link, so the, note the link and just visit this link in this website 
seven types of ambiguity has been elaborated and analyzed very comprehensively and um, in a student friendly way too. So go check it out. It's not sponsored, but in literarydevices.net, many literary devices have been uh, explained really well. So you can go visit this link. Moving on very quickly to Clint Brooks, who wrote the seminal book, The Well Wrought Urn. I have this book with me, uh, so The Well Wrought Urn. This book I have bought, uh, The Well Wrought Urn. And I'm going to, I'm reading it. It's a really very, very interesting book it is. Okay. So um, uh, the subtitle of this is Studies in the Structure of Poetry. He also wrote two essays called Understanding Poetry and Understanding Fiction. Okay. And he wrote it jointly with Robert Brain Warren. He also wrote Language of Paradox and another very important book called Kids. Sylvian historian, history without footnotes. Core concepts of Clean Brooks are paradox, which he discussed in his book, Language of Paradox. And another very important concept frequently asked in net is heresy of paraphrase, which was discussed in his book, The Well Wrought Urn. So what is paradox? It is the inherent tension of meaning inside poetry. He says that wherever there is poetry, there is paradox. And you cannot escape paradox in poetry. Paradox makes poetry. And in this book, Language of Paradox, he discusses two poems. One is composed upon Westminster Bridge by William Wordsworth and canonization by John Donne. And he discusses how Paradox is a seminal, is, a, is an internal core element of poetry, is an inherent element of poetry. Paradox, for example, if I say that, uh, suppose Ted Hughes, in his poem, he, in his poems, he celebrates animal forces, the forces of animals. And at the same time, he talks about animals. At the same time, he he also he also hints towards hints at human nature and many other aspects of human nature. So it is a paradox. He is talking about animals, and also he is hinting, he is pointing towards some other things also. That is a paradox. A poem never talks of one single thing. There is always a paradox, a conglomeration of numerous, numerous concepts, numerous perceptions. Okay? And that is a paradox. You cannot pinpoint one single concept behind one poem. Okay. It's a very deep thought. I'm just discussing the basic of it. I hope uh, I, I hope I'm not being too complicated. If you have any question, any doubt, please address them in the comment section so that I can clear your doubts. Heresy of paraphrase is another thing. This is very, very interesting. And I support this theory. Heresy means the problem. And paraphrase, you know, the summary, okay? In simple words, this is a problem of summary, summarization. In, in his book, The Well Wrought Urn, he talks about this and he says that form and content, these two things in a poem are inseparable and you cannot reduce a poem into a summary. You, a poem cannot ever be summarized. Okay, Whenever you are summarizing a poem, there is a problem, there is a heresy. What is that heresy? You must be leaving out some uh, aspect or the other in the poem because you are summarizing it. So you are leaving something, okay? A poem is complete in its whole and there is always paradox going on in this poem. And when you are summarizing it, you are neglecting the paradox and thus you are making a heresy. That thus you are generating a problem. Efer Lewis, you know, he was associated with the American School of New Criticism and uh, he was um, in support of the high culture and he was the one who, who um, you know, who 
put much emphasis on the moral purpose of wor one work. He was the one critic who put a lot of emphasis on moral purpose. In his book, The Great Tradition, in his book, The Great Tradition, he talks about four great novelists, Jane Austen, George Eliot, Henry James, and Joseph Conrad to be the greatest pillars of English literature. And later he also adds D.H. Lawrence. He, for him, Charles Dickens was really um, a standard novelist, but he lacked mature standards and interest to a certain extent, except in hard times. So only hard times by Charles Dickens was appreciated by F.R. Lewis, but all the other works of Charles Dickens were, were um, not appreciated. 1948 was a year when the Great Tradition book was published. It's a very important date to remember that. In uh, his another influential book <clears throat> that is called New Bearings in English Poetry. You can very well imagine that 1932, well, <laughs> we are doing a paradoxical thing here. We are studying new criticism where they are completely neglecting the context and historical era in which the works are written. And we are kind of trying to, I am kind of trying to give you an idea in which age it was written, just to give you some idea about the content of it. Mm, okay, just pardon me, Mr. F. R. Lewis and all the other new critics. Okay, so new bearings in English and uh, Poetry, it was written in the modern era, 1930s, it was written in 1932. Yes, it was written in 1932. And it, this book is a study of the contemporary situation. The, the subtitle of the book is A Study of the Contemporary Situation. And in this book, Efer Lewis attacked some Victorian poets, like um, um, the Victorian poets like Tennyson and other uh, Browning, Okay, and he discussed the importance of some Victorian poets tilting towards a modernist, um, uh, modernist trends like Eliot, Ezra Pound, G uh, Jim Hopkins, etc. Okay, uh, new bearings in English poetry. A question about this book was asked in UGC in 2021, so it's very important from that point of view. Remember that. Now, another very, very important uh, aspect of new criticism is our intentional fallacy and effective fallacy discussed by Wimsatt and Beardsley, who in their uh, seminal work, Verbal Icon, the um, studies in the meaning of poetry published in 1954. Um, there were two controversial papers published by them but they were published before. Uh, in 1946, Intentional Fallacy was published. And in 1941, Effective Fallacy was published. Intentional Fallacy is when we put too much importance on the intention of the author. That is a fallacy because uh, that that is barring us from know from from knowing what is exactly what is actually um, there in the poem or the literary work because we are putting too much importance on the intention of the author that is called intentional fallacy and affective fallacy is when we are putting too much in, uh, importance on the effect the literary work has on the on the reader so when much importance, excessive importance is on the author, it is intentional fallacy. When much importance is given on the reader, it is affective fallacy. Uh, okay, J.C. Ransom. J.C. Ransom's books, important books are The New Criticism, which was published in 1941. The World's Body. Uh, in, this, in this book, The World's Body, uh, there are a few essays written by John Crow Ransom, essays on Milton um, and other important literary artists. And here he makes ontological criticism, which is very important. So in the book, The World's Body, ontological criticism is taken up by J.C. Ransom. He also writes another book called Poems About God, 
which was praised later by poet Robert Graves and poet Robert Frost. Okay. John Ransom was associated with also um, another school, very important literary school called the Fugitives, which I will talk about by the end of this video. Okay. J.C. Ransom gives us three kinds of poems. He says that there are three kinds of poems. One is physical, one is platonic, and another is metaphysical. Physical poems emphasize on present things, not ideas, only the things, the concrete things. Platonic poems emphasize on the abstract ideas. The, the examples can be the romantic poetry and the Victorian poetry. Metaphysical poetry is a blend of physical and the platonic or the blend of the reason and the emotion. Moving on, R.P. Blackmore, another seminal figure in New Criticism, in his books, uh, A Critic's Jobs of Work, The Double Agent, Form and Value in Modern Poetry, The Expense of Greatness, uh, he talks about his own take on um, New Criticism. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, R.P. Blackmore talks about two kinds of critics in his book, A Critic's Jobs of Work. In his book, A Critic's Jobs of Work, he distinguishes <coughs> between two kinds of critics, amateur critic and professional critic. So there can be a question called uh, who distinguish between two kinds of critics? That is R.P. Blackmore. He was also a poet, okay? So amateur critics are the critics who uh, criticizes works, literary works based on their own interest. And professional critics are those who uh, whose interest is solely based on money and they are confined by some ideas, okay? Uh, in UGC net in some previous year, one quote was asked, okay? And it was in all reading, there must be the physical distance, like walking. Criticism is pretty nearly universal act. So R.P. Blackmore was the uh, writer of this line. And he talks about walking as similar act of critiquing or uh, reading. He, uh, he compares the act of walking and act of reading because both of them are constant, intricate, shifting and catching of balance. Okay. So R.P. Blackmore is the one who kept walking and reading side by side. Alan Tate, who was a poet, uh, who was a poet laureate. Okay. And his important books are Men of Letters in Modern World and Ode to the Confederate Dead. In his book, Ode to the Confederate Dead, he questions whether his contemporaries are capable of true honor to the past. It much similar in line with the um, ethos of Eliot and Harold Bloom, who also took up the, um, uh, up the subject of the influence of the past over the present. Okay, this is a poem, Ode to the Confederate Dead. And this is very ironic in its stone. And it has a pattern of a pindaric ode. It talks about two kinds of meaning, different than we uh, said before. Who, another, who, was, who was the other person who talked about two kinds, uh, four kinds of meanings? That was I.A. Richards, sense, feeling, tone, and intention. And here, two kinds of meanings is, um, done is uh, taken up by Alan Tate. Alan Tate talks about two kinds of meaning, denotative and connotative. Denotative meaning is the surface meaning and connotative meaning is the hidden meaning or the inside meaning. Okay. So it denotes something that means the surface, the external meaning is something else. Connotative meanings is, uh, connotative meaning is the hidden meaning or the internal meaning. Okay, and he says the true poetry is the one 
the true poetry is a literary work that has a complete balance that has a complete con uh, complete sort of um what should i say combination of denotative and connotative meaning the same thing is tension in poetry alan tate talks about tension tate t tension t so tate talks about tension in poetry so Alan Tate talks about tension in poetry and he talks about two tension, intention and extension, okay? Intention, again, is a metaphorical meaning and extension is a literal meaning. And uh, he <clears throat> says that it is a poetic element. The tension is a poetic el element and that is a universal quality of a poem. It always will have a tension. Much, much, not very, but to a certain extent, similar to Cleon Brook's idea of the paradox. There is always a tension inside the poem, inside the poetic work. A uh, younger generation of new critic was Wensi Booth, who talks about reliable and unreliable narrator. And his two masterpieces are the rhetoric of fiction and the rhetoric of irony. Last but not the least, I'm talking about two important schools of new criticism. There were two schools. One was new Aristotelians, were also called um, Chicago critics, Chicago School of Criticism. And uh, this school was established by the professors of the Department of Humanities of uh, the University of Chicago. And they attempted to revive the humanities and make them institutionally more competitive with the sciences. The most prominent figures are R.S. Craig, Elder Olson, Richard McKeon, Norman McLean, Bernard Winberg. Wensi Booth was a second generation Chicago critic. Okay. Elder Olson was the one who wrote the theory of comedy. And R.S. Crane was the founder. R.S. Crane was the founder of the New Aristotelian School. The name of the manifesto of New Aristotelians were Critics and Criticism, Ancient and Modern. In 1952, it was published. And that was like the manifesto. Okay. The manifesto of this school, Critics and Criticism, Ancient and Modern. It was a subtitle, ancient and modern. It was a subtitle. Another school was Fugitives, also known as the Agrarian School of Poetry, also known as the 12 Southerners, Vanderbilt Agrarians, Nashville Agrarians, Tennessee Agrarians, Fugitive Agrarians, Southern Agrarians. Okay, many names. The unofficial leader of this school was John Crow Ransom. Most prominent members were John Crow Ransom and Robert Penn Warren. And the manifesto of this school was, I'll take my stand. Subtitled, The South and the Agrarian Tradition. It was written, published in 1930. The members, some of the members were Donald Davidson, Jesse Ransom, of course, Alan Tate, Weaver, and Robert Penn Warren. And many more. So that was New Criticism. The essence of new criticism for you all, you will get one PDF in the description box that I have made for you all. It's a very brief idea of the lecture and you can take a, you can download that for free and you can take a printout if you want. Also note down all the important things that I have discussed and do not forget to comment. Please do comment. I will expect you all to comment. And please subscribe to my channel for more contents like this. Like this video, share this with your friends. And also, if you are interested in knowing more about literary theory and criticism in a crisp way, you can give me, um, you can comment or you can drop me an email to have my notes that got me my chair. The destination, a crisp and student-friendly guide to, I'm sorry, there is a typo, to net said chair get in English. Thank you so much for watching and uh, thank you so much. The lecture two will come very soon. Don't forget to let me know how you like this video. Uh, if you have any doubts, any questions, any queries like that, address them in my comment section. And well, I hope this series gets successful and I hope I was able to help you a little bit.
if not much. So thank you so much. See you in my next video.